Aloha, I'm Chris Leatham, and this is The Economy and You, and welcome everybody to our today's show. Today's show, we're going to be talking about energy. Wow, energy's in the news all the time. Uh, it seems like every day there's a conversation about energy. Today's guest is Carl Campagna from Kamaka Green. Welcome to the show. Thanks thank you very much. you on the show. Absolutely, yeah, great, thank you. Appreciate great. it. Um, so we're going to talk about options. We're going to talk about energy, where we're at today sort of the challenges of where we're at today. We're talking about the next Terra and Hico merger acquisition. Um, and let's, so, but I wanted to kind of start off first, Carl, and, and ask you, why did you get involved in this? Why is this an, even an issue that's in, important to you? Sure, uh, well, first of all, um, my company, Kamaka Green, what we do is we do uh, energy, initially starting off as energy uh, development, uh, and environmental services that we provide for land development uses, for construction of buildings. We do federal, we do state, we do commercial, we can even do residential. So, so we, would they, people call you up and say, hey, I want to create an e efficiency energy solution, correct. An efficient energy solution. Um, what can you do for me? Correct. The, what they would do is, uh, I don't generally get called, uh, Kamaka Green does not generally get called by the, by the off taker, by the business owner or by the residential homeowner. Uh -huh. We will oftentimes be called in by the developer or by a funding source that we've got $18 billion we want to spend. Can you help us develop this into the sure, into this let me market? help you spend that for you. Exactly. <laughs> I'm more than happy to help you, but yeah. then I have to go through a checklist of, okay, for, first of all, verify uh, that all of your money is ready and available and verify uh -huh. what the criteria and, and, and requirements are in order to spend that money that's right. in this market, and then I'll let you know how viable it is for you to get into this market. So that's one thing that I did, and I went through 20, 30 different funding sources over the period of five, six years, uh -huh. uh, saying, okay, you know what, based on what this market need is, your source of money isn't going to be able to apply because you're not going to allow anybody below a 700 credit score. Mm. Um, you're not, you know, as far as the residential is concerned. Right. You're going to require 30, 35 cents per kilowatt hour on your sale, whereas other people are already offering it at 20 cents or 25 cents. So you're already above and beyond, and you have higher credit Sounds like a scores. lot of accounting. There's definitely accounting and there's definitely yeah. understanding exactly how these models can work in the best way. For, for, and, and, and from my perspective, I always look at it from not just your financial perspective, but you know mm -hmm. what? The homeowner or the yeah. business owner. Yeah. We must make sure that they are taken care of. We must make sure that what you are offering to them benefits them, not just you. Benefits them today and benefits them in the long term, right. not just you and your money that isn't from our islands. Okay. All right. Okay. Well. So you, you got involved in all of this, and then, then we had this whole thing with NextTerra coming in and mm -hmm. tapping on Hiko's shoulder and say, hey, we'd like to hang out with you for a while, and maybe, hey, we're going to buy you, uh, buy you up and uh, acquire you. Yeah. And what do you think of that? Um, so now we're in the middle of this, um, and we've been having conversations on a daily basis. There are pros and cons, obviously, um, from both sides. Um, from one, one aspect of this, of course, is Nextel brings, or Nextel brings in their resources, their technology, their business models. Is that helpful to us? Uh, it is, you can perceive it as being helpful to us. Do we actually need that? Connie Lau recently came out and said, we can actually achieve our goals without them and without their money. Okay. So Connie and, Lau said this. And Connie Lau is, for people who don't know Connie Lau. Uh, Connie Lau is current, well, she is the, the CEO of Hawaii Energy Industries. Okay. My electric industries. So she was the one who initiated the conversation be between Connie Lau and uh, Jim Robo. They got together and they started these conversations about two years ago mm -hmm. uh, or so, uh, beginning this whole conversation about this possibility. There's been talk going back even before then uh, with Kuokoa, uh, people trying to figure out what we can do to buy HECO out so we can get a new management, a new organizational structure in there. So there's been talk for a while. Well. Nextervo is the one who showed up, and they showed up with investors and money from all of their resources. Well, you want to pique somebody's interest. That's how you do it, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> you show up and say, you know what? We have access. We can offer you $4 billion, $4.3 billion. We can, uh, and that's, what, that's the number. $4.3 billion. What we can do is we can come in, we buy it all out, we pay everybody. We can own it. But who are they paying off, ultimately? They're buying, they're buying shares on the stock market to get a, 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 um, what we call controlling interest of the company. Uh, what essentially, essentially, well, a number of different things. They're it's buying. Pub it's publicly held. They're buying all of the assets, and they're buying all of the liabilities, and they're buying all of the shares. 
Okay. So that's what. The, so they're buying all phases of it. Is what they're trying to so do. So now, if they buy all that up, anybody that's old holding Hico stock essentially gets six share stock. Uh, no, they get bought out, and they probably will be given an opportunity at some point to buy some shares again. But they're being bought out. So they're. Just Having to they're going to be shares. gone. They're going to be out of it. They're going to be paid off four times the amount of what their shares are actually worth today. They're going to be paid four to ten times, depending on who you talk to. Can I still buy some of those shares? <laughs> see, <laughs> see? <laughs> but see, but think about this though. Yeah. It's a short-term gain. It's a short-term gain. Okay. Because then what? Well, it's a gain for the stockholder. Is it a gain for the people who are the users of the? Of Which the includes the stockholders. Well, in some cases, yes. Yes. So. Um, <clears throat> so is it a gain for them? In the short term, it's going to be the same. There are going to be no changes. There will not be a decrease in any utility rates. Historically, for the past decade, we've had 5 to 6% increases every year in our utility rates. Mm -hmm. And we have some of the most expensive electricity in the United States. In, exactly. And so we're already high, and it just continues to go higher. Yeah. So is it better? Well, it, no, it isn't better because they're not going to change it. And they're still a for-profit entity. And in fact, it gets worse when you consider the fact that they have a stated goal. Next Era has a stated goal of being the largest energy company in the United States. So that being the case, we're here in Hawaii. Their executive office and decision making is in Florida, 5,000 miles away. Mm -hmm. They're making decisions about what we're doing here and how we're doing it and why. And they're not here. They're not local, first of all. Mm -hmm. Second of all, all of their investors aren't local. Right. So all of the money that then flows out of the state through the utility goes to external sources. None of that money stays So there. there's no retention of, of There's no profits. retention of profits at that point. But we don't, I mean, only people who in Hawaii that own stock where you have a retention of profits. Correct. Because you're paying dividends and the shares, of course, go up in value. Correct. Right? Correct. Okay. So, you know, I don't know what percentage of the stock is actually held by local investors. Uh, currently, the exact number, I don't know the exact number either. But the, the interesting, interestingly, it has been suggested uh, by, uh, by Next Era. I'm not sure which member, whether it was Jim mm -hmm. Rover or someone else, that majority of the board of directors and stockholders and shareholders don't live in Hawaii anyway. Well, that's actually wrong. Okay. The board of directors actually does reside here currently. Okay. Uh, it's, they will not once they, you know, if they would be but successful. But this, is, this is the challenge anytime you have a for-profit model. Correct. Okay, so uh, <coughs> as a for-profit for right. monopoly. Well, okay, yeah, it is kind of a monopoly because they are the only game in town. Correct. But they have to go through the legislature or they have to go through a process to get a rate increase. Uh, they have to go through the PUC. They request a rate increase through the PUC, mm -hmm. the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, goes through a docket. There's uh, potential for interveners and a conversation and hearings. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that, they get given the, the increase and, or and, not. And despite, despite all that, they still get approved every year for their they rate increases. They get approved every year. <laughs> <laughs> they get approved every year, uh, whether they have 100 or 400 or however many lawyers who show up and say, we're ready to, to have this conversation, and mm -hmm. thank you, we'll take that 5% increase and, and move along. <laughs> it's sort of, sort, of a, sort of a gimme, isn't it? So. It has been a gimme. <laughs> so now, um, now, looking at that, um, what kind, now there's some public hearings going on, yes. and uh, one of the things that we wanted to address was, do people still have a chance to provide testimony or submit comments on this? They, they do. On everything that's going on. They do. The, the public hearings have concluded. The last one was uh, October 27th here on Oahu at McKinley mm -hmm. High School. Um, I was able to attend that one. Um, but there were several others on, uh, I think, most of the other islands. I don't know that they went to Lanai. They may have, actually, no, they did go to Lanai. They went to Lanai, uh, Molokai, Maui, and, um, and Big Island. Pretty much covers the all the bases. They covered all of them. Yeah. Um, Kauai, obviously, they have their own, their uh, uh, KIUC, Kauai, right. their, their, their own co-op, uh, which is um, one of the models that we think is worth considering. Well, I want to talk about that a little bit later, why, why, exactly. why, 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 why um, you aren't <clears throat> ready as a co-op. Right. So, uh, so those hearings went through, and in each of those hearings, the overwhelming sentiment from the public is opposed. Because that's really all the PUC wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear how many bullet points you can rattle off and how many statistics you can rattle off. They wanted to know from the people how many are opposed, how many are in favor of this proposal. Well, my question is, is I mean, when you talk about issues like this, most people just don't care. Um, they'll just sort of f philosophically ab absorb the additional cost or just take it in stride. Yeah. So who, who has a vested interest in this? Every ratepayer and every parent 
has a vested interest in this because where are we going to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, mm -hmm. when many of us are gone and our kids have to pay for what just happened, the decision that is being made within the next, uh, conceivably within the next eight, nine months, that decision is going to be made and will impact our children in 30 years from now because mm -hmm. of what this, uh, there, obviously there can be changes made on the road. Right. But we are at a very crucial point where this is the time to thoroughly consider all aspects and to thoroughly consider all opportunities. This is one opportunity. It's important to recognize mm -hmm. that Next Era is one opportunity. And it's one paradigm. It's one way of solving exactly. or expecting somebody else to come in and help us solve some of the problems that we have so ourselves have not necessarily solved well. We have not chosen to make a priority of solving. Okay, or you could say that. We haven't made a priority of solving certain problems. Yes. Sometimes I think, well, maybe it's we don't have the expertise. Sometimes we don't understand the technologies, or we don't have, we're not coordinating well. It just seems like, um, or there, there's this sort of ongoing adversarial relationship that exists. Mm -hmm. um, and does that impede progress uh, in our ability to, to bring online new technologies? Uh, yes, obviously, anything that causes a conflict will slow something or delay something. Mm -hmm. So whatever, wherever it comes from. And in this instance, what we have is a for-profit entity that is Hawaiian Electric Industries, and they've been a for-profit entity for 100 years. Mm -hmm. And they have their charter in order to be this for-profit monopoly. And for those who don't know, this was set up originally 100 years ago or so for a specific reason. They were given this opportunity and said, we will let you be the sole generator and provider of electricity as long as you make sure to get electricity to all rural districts so that everyone has the opportunity to get electricity. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would just stay. That was the mandate. That was the mandate. That was the original reason why they were afforded this. Okay, but now they, well, we've grown, the island's grown population-wise. We've grown just a little bit since then. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. So now they're still a for-profit entity. Mm -hmm. Uh, we haven't converted them away from a for-profit entity. Nope. Uh, shareholders make money off the shares. Of course, we know that if you're uh, a retiree, these types of shares are very attractive to you. Sure. Because they pay nice dividends, and there's not a lot of fluctuation in price, generally speaking. And so it's, it, and Hawaii has a lot of retirees, so it would seem to be that we would continue to do it this way. Yeah, if, if that were the only reason, uh, but that isn't the only reason okay. as well. Um, but I, I would actually suggest this. If it were ratepayer owned, they would still, like Kauai, okay. they would still be getting dividends. Kauai still pays dividends. But you don't buy the stock. No, you're a ratepayer. You're you a rate buy payer. the stock because you are paying the electricity. At the end of the year, oh, we have this much money. We made this much money in profit that we will now redistribute into infrastructure, and we will all vote and agree. Well, we can use a new upgrade in this area and this area, so we want to spend some of that. Do we agree on that? Okay, good. We'll do that. Now, the remaining portion, we will distribute out to all the ratepayers. Uh-huh. And how is that working in Kauai? It seems to be working very well in Kauai. Okay, but Kauai is a much smaller population. Sure. So wouldn't that create, when you have a larger population with that same business model, is it going to work just as efficiently? You can uh, take a look at uh, different geography, di different, different conditions perhaps, but you can take a look at, and uh, Robert Harris actually pointed this out, um, take a look at Sacramento. Sacramento is a municipal-owned entity. They've made this transition as well, and they have roughly 1.4 million people so, that they service through this model. So kind of like us. Exactly. Kind of like us. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. Sounds good. I'm Chris Leatham, and this is The Economy and You. Today's guest is Carl Campagna, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned for more. Aloha. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Hi, my name is Cindy Matsuki, and I host the show High Growth with HTDC on Think Tech Hawaii. 
This is the show where we talk about all things tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing because there's so many things going on in Hawaii and more people should know about them. So this is the program that you can come and find out about all the things happening in Hawaii. And this show also airs on Level 54 along with Think Tech Hawaii. And it broadcasts live every, every other Tuesday at 3 p.m. So don't forget, check out the show Tuesday, 3 p.m. every other week. High Growth with HTDC. Thanks. <laughs> We're back again. Hi, I'm Chris Letha. This is The Economy and You. Today's guest is Carl Campagna. And we're talking about one of the most complicated and largest decisions that Hawaii is going to have to make that will impact our future for the next 30, 40 years. And that is the merger acquisition of HECO by Nextera. This is a big deal because if we do it, we could get hammered one way. But if we don't do it, we're going to get hammered another way. Uh, well, yes, and that's where we have to be very careful okay. and very thorough in our investigation of this and not just say, you know what, they're going to give us a bunch of money. This sounds easy. Hey, let's have them give us a bunch of money, and hey, we'll just go with it, and we'll be happy. Well, you know what, if we didn't thoroughly consider what that means mm -hmm. and all of the implications... And what you're talking about, the, 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 the consequences, the unintended and the unintended consequences of exactly. that. Exactly. Okay, so exactly. some of the intended consequences would be what? Because some, this is the things that we want to happen. Right. Some of the intended consequences are there will be an infusion of money to help address some of the infrastructure troubles uh, okay. that, that exist. That's some of the intended consequences. They are saying, they are promising that they are going to stick to our mm -hmm. uh, renewable portfolio standard of reaching 100% renewable by 2045. They're promising okay. that. They're promising a list of other things. Most of it sounds good. They also promised they won't fire anybody for four years. Okay. And then they can what happens four anymore. years in one day? <laughs> yeah. Okay. They also said they won't be making any rate changes. They won't be increasing mm -hmm. the rate for four years. Okay. They're also not going to decrease the rate for four years. And then how much do they increase it after four years? None of that. But does it still have to go through the PUC to get an approval of a rate increase? Yes. But if they make the case, and depending upon, and, and as we have discussed, every time the utility has gone to the PUC requesting mm -hmm. an increase. It's a gimme. It's a, it's a, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. You can have it. And, and it's because, well, we don't understand. As the PUC, we are not professionals in this area. We don't know how to assess the grid. We have to get third-party entities to assess the grid and tell us this is what's needed, and therefore all of your additional costs that are needed are justified. We yeah. see that. Makes sense. Okay, fine. Yes, we'll give you, you a 5% increase. Okay. So what's the impact of the, some of the changes that we've seen that have come down from HECO? Um, we talked a little bit about um, how there was a problem with getting permits, like the permitting process got jammed up. Now, how did yeah. that sort of get started? Um, well, I don't think you have to be cynical about this, but uh, when you realize that the conversation between NextEra and, and, and ATI did not begin last December when they made, made the announcement. Mm -hmm. It began significantly before then. Mm. And perhaps the summer of 2013, perhaps the spring of 2013, perhaps 2012, is when these conversations began. Um, I think there's a specific date that they say that uh, um, Connie Lau met with Jim Robo in Vegas, I think, at some point. Okay. Um, and they began that conversation. Well, one of the things that came out of that was, you know what you need to do? You need to shut down and decrease the uh, number of solar electric panels that are being installed. And the best way to do that is to funnel it and make sure that everything must go through the utility. Okay, so now, and, and here's my thought process on that. It's because if you want somebody to buy you, somebody's going to come in to buy you, you want to have the highest possible valuation. Exactly. The way you have the highest valuation is that you, you have the highest amount of revenue and or profits at the end of the year. Projected revenue Projected revenues. The there year. you go. That's right. And so if you're not getting those projected revenues, if you're not achieving those, what happens is the valuation of your entity goes down. Exactly. So therefore, let's cut people off at the knees who want to put solar power on their houses. That's right. So that we're maintaining the oh. projected level of kilowatt hour sales into the future. So if mm. we can guarantee that then, yes, your valuation stays here. So it's exactly. a little uh, self-serving. Absolutely. But that's not what they told the, the, the public. No, they told the public that it was a very technical concern and that the grid is in such a state 
through because of how old it is, it is antiquated, um, and because of the fact that, well, no one has really done this much penetration, renewable energy penetration into a grid. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's going to happen. We need to prevent brownouts and blackouts. It's a problem. We also need to prevent something called islanding so that we don't have power going back and forth in the wrong direction. They said it's a technical concern. We must slow this down. We must make sure that we are assessing it on a system by system basis so that we can clearly understand uh -huh. this, this integration process. So it sounds like there's maybe not a cause and effect, but clearly there's a correlation. Um, you mean in what way? In other words, while we're having this conversation, at the same time they're passing, uh, they're making changes to... Yes. Okay. Yeah, so again, because they are positioning, as that's you were right, saying. That's right. That's right. They so are I, positioning I can't prove themselves. that one, one exactly. did the other, but yeah, no, the correlation... Exactly. You exactly. kind of, okay, question mark pops up. It makes sense that, oh, well, they want to maintain their valuation, as you said. Well, yes. the best way to do that is to maintain <laughs> their number of rate payers and the level of rate mm -hmm. payment. Mm -hmm. It seems very coincidental, but okay, we'll just <laughs> let it go with that. Now, what other sort of weird and wonderful things have been going on with... Uh, 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 with some of the other, cha other changes since September 30th? Well, yeah, September 6th, 2013 is when they made this change to funnel it. And it was at that point that... Um, as we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. it was at that point that uh, there were, at any given time, 60 uh, renewable energy, PV, solar power installation companies in mm -hmm. the state of Hawaii, at right. any given time. Uh, and they were going crazy. And they're they were going crazy. They were building at 40% 40 per, 40 yeah. a year. They were increasing, increasing, increasing. And, uh -huh. and it, was, it was a great industry, and it was a, as a result of that, the costs of PV systems decreased and declined. The costs of the products themselves decreased and declined significantly. Yes. Really, minutely, a quarter of what they were. So that was one of those impacts. So the market increased, the prices go down. Mm -hmm. Supply and demand, that's how that works. Right. So from that perspective, it was huge. Well, we needed to slow this down, right, because we need to make sure we're maintaining the revenues into the future. We need to slow down the amount that we're letting go. Okay, so we slow it down. There are companies that I'm aware of Mm -hmm. that had 15 crews. 15, uh, one crew exists somewhere between four and six employees, mm -hmm. installers. People that climb on the roof, you have an electrician, people that know how to attach to the roof, um, put the PV panels on, do all the wiring and all that stuff. Four to six people per crew. Right. Some companies out there had 15 crews, uh, some talk about 15 to 20 crews. After 2013, after uh, September 6, 2013, within three months, those companies went from 15 crews to three crews, literally decimating the industry. So all of those high-paying jobs, that not, wasn't just the installation jobs, because those were high-paying. Right. It was also all the sales jobs, and mm -hmm. all the admin jobs, and mm -hmm. all of the processing jobs. They all disappeared. They all went away. Okay, so it really shrunk down the, uh, the industry. So Huge. what you were basically left with were people who were servicing existing systems. Servicing existing systems, which is one of the problems, operations and maintenance going forward, we need to make sure so all these companies, so many of these companies that did these installations that gave you 10, 15, 20 year warranties, mm -hmm. they don't exist anymore because the industry was decimated. Mm. So now someone needs to come in and pick those up and take care of those. So how that's being done is one of the interesting questions as well. But this was all to me intended or unintended consequence, I'm not sure on that side. Uh -huh, uh -huh. All I know is the industry folded in on itself and there are a few remaining that are out there doing their job. Many of them shifted back to solar thermal, mm -hmm. so doing hot water panels. Uh, as they shifted away from that for a while because there was so much PV work, so they shifted back to that. Some are shifting to energy efficiency or, or uh, uh, home energy systems that are more uh, uh, comprehensive, so they're having to shift. It's fine, totally fine from a market perspective. Mm -hmm. Rules change, we make changes, the economy shifts, the market changes in order to adapt to that. No problem whatsoever. Right. However, it was fabricated to have this entire industry collapse. So this is one of the problems. You know, we talk about the different types of risks that there are in business. Yes. And policy changes, changes in the law, this is a kind of risk that impacts companies. Exactly. Now, one of the challenges for Hawaii is we already have a big black eye. Uh, again, we've come out as the worst state uh, in, in the United States to do business. Uh, and I really hate to see that. I really love this state, and I really hate to see us be tarnished that way. Because at the same time, we want to be doing things to grow our ecosystem, our high-tech ecosystem, doing things that, are, that enhance our sustainability, where we can do things in Hawaii and power generation that are unique because of where we're situated uh, geographically. Right. We should be doing all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. In we the, you know. And so 
When you have something like a utility that is creating a barrier to entry, this seems like a problem. It seems like we're exactly. shooting ourselves in the foot. Exactly. exactly. So, okay, so um, let's talk about how do we, we're going to go forward. Let's talk about going forward from here. If we were going to go forward in an ideal world um, and look at the model of Kauai, mm -hmm. let's take a look at that, okay? It's a co-op. So let's talk about what a co-op is so people know what we're talking about. Sure. Uh, a a co-op in this sense, and feel free to jump in. Um, a co-op in this sense is a, it's a cooperative arrangement. What you've got is uh, all of your rate payers essentially become not shareholders per se, but kind of shareholders. They all become members of this nonprofit cooperative. It's, it's like a mutual company. In other words, um, everybody or a, a, like... Um, Everybody's an owner in right. a co-op, right? Right. So everybody contributes to the cause. I mean, you, you use the services, but you also are a stockholder, uh, and so you reap the benefits. Correct. Correct. So as a result, mm -hmm. you have generation, mm -hmm. electric generation from multiple sources. Okay. Uh, it is fascinating and interesting to realize that on Kauai, they have more large-scale commercial than anywhere else in the state. Mm. So 7 megawatt, 14 megawatt, 9 megawatt systems on Kauai, when we've been told here on Oahu and on the rest of the islands, we can't go larger than 5 megawatts in any one system. It's too much. That's an interesting comment. It is an interesting comment. Why can they do it on Kauai, but they can't do it here, especially on Oahu? Why? Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure why. Okay, well, well, we'll let that hang out there because I don't think anyone's really answered that other than it's not to our best interest in one way or another. It's not to our <laughs> bottom line interest anyway, certainly. It's, okay, so, all right, for me. For especially me. if it's not being done by the utility. Right. Because again, HEI is a vertical. Well, they do all of the distribution. They're they doing do everything. all of the generation. So, they do all of the, yeah. well, So we've got this sort of vertical monopoly. Now, can we be chopping it in pieces like this? It's conceivable. And, and, and then have distribution set aside from power generation and maybe we have somebody like Nextera be responsible for doing power generation. Absolutely. Maybe they have a part of that, but maybe they don't have to have all of that? Um, yes, that's possible. It is certainly feasible, and it is worth full exploration. exploration so that we can understand that and how that would work. And I know that Rep. Chris Lee has actually put legislation out requesting that we pursue these options. And I know... Everyone from the energy industry, everyone mm -hmm. from the environmental sector, all agrees. And everyone from, if you just take it from a business perspective mm -hmm. and th from, a, from a public policy perspective, how can you just continue to go in one direction if you've got the option of considering six others? We must pursue all of them to see which is the best one for us. Well, to you've got a nonprofit model, which is great on Kauai. Yeah. But there's also such a thing as a competitive business model. Correct. Okay, so one of the things about breaking up the utility and distribution from energy generation to energy storage is that you can now have competition in the marketplace. Correct. Okay, maybe that's a better business model. Maybe because when you have a competitive business model, one, it promotes high tech, which yes, I love. I'm an advocate for high tech because I'm a computer geek. So I'm an advocate for high tech. But I'm also, I also think about it in terms of the, the, the technological changes that are occurring today are occurring at a pace that is parabolic. Yeah. So if we're having all these sort of great innovations, maybe the best way to do that is say, look, we're going to give you a, a, a place where you can bring your innovations in and plug them into our grid. We have the unique opportunity. In uh -huh. Hawaii. I mean, we're already the world leader with the, I guess, amount per capita, perhaps, uh, with renewable energy. But everyone always looks at us. How do we achieve this? I mean, you can, you can look globally and say, okay, I think Ireland or Scotland or Denmark or some mm -hmm. of these are Germany. They have a higher percentage. Well, they're also connected to other grids, so they can do different things in other ways. Mm -hmm. We're not connected to any other grid. We're, we're islands. Right. So and is our grid a smart grid? Our grid is not currently a smart grid. However, so, uh -huh. I will say this. <laughs> there is latent technology inside of many of these inverters. And the inverter is that piece that gets mounted onto your wall. You've got your PV panels on the roof, you've got your inverter that gets mounted on the wall, and then that inverter goes into your electrical panel box. Okay. That inverter converts the DC power from the panels to AC. AC power. 
That's what that inverter does. Latent technology inside and, and uh, uh, language inside many, if not most, of these inverters, certainly over the last, past few years, mm -hmm. have the ability, given the right coding sequence, you add that sequence, you add the values that are necessary, and you now have a demand response capabilities that opens the door to a smart grid scenario as long as you've got a management system that can do load sharing and set it up appropriately. So that's what we need to talk about. It's already there yeah. in many cases and wouldn't take that much to upgrade the ones that are there. Okay. I'm, we're going to go to another commercial. Okay. We're going to come back for our last segment. I'm Chris Leatham. This is The Economy and You. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more. Aloha. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Hi, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is our flagship show, which plays 4 to 5 p.m. every Wednesday. And the, uh, the supporters of that show are uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum and uh, Hawaii Energy. And luckily enough, we have representatives of both of them right here today to tell you more about what they think about the show. Uh, Sharon Moriwaki at my left is uh, co-chair of Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and she goes first. Sharon? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. I'm so glad that we have this Hawaii, the state of clean energy. This was uh, two years ago when we started this, and we have continued it because it's so important. And there's so many developments happening across the state. And we hope you'll tune in every Wednesday, 4 to 5. It's wonderful. And uh, Ray is uh, Hawaii Energy. Ray, what is your thought about the same subject? Well, I, I agree completely with Sharon uh, that uh, we are talking about every Wednesday, 4 to 5, uh, we talk about some of the most important subjects that uh, are affecting the islands uh, now and into the future. Uh, energy clean energy. We need it. Uh, we often run into uh, new ideas that we had not uh, thought about before. Uh, we did just today, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think we're going to have more of that uh, in the future. So uh, come on down and, uh, and watch us uh, 4 to 5 on Wednesdays, um, and we'll uh, see what happens. We'll see you then. Aloha. Aloha. Are we back? We're back. Hi. Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm Chris Leatham. This is The Economy and You. Today's guest is Carl Campagna, and we are talking about something. It's not so visual, you know, when we talk about energy. You don't get, like, nice pictures of things. And sometimes when you're doing a TV show or a radio show and you're talking about energy, it's a rather complicated topic. You know, it's, there's a lot of sausage in this factory that's yeah. being made. <laughs> um, and so, um, we, um, so... I want to kind of talk about um, why this is important, and, and it's as you said earlier, our geographic location is uniquely unique. Absolutely. And that we, can, we have the ability to take advantage of all kinds of energy options. Yes, we do. Uh, energy generation options is what we're talking about, the ability to generate energy. Exactly. From renewable sources mm -hmm. uh, or, and natural sources. So from wave technology to geothermal technology. So wave technology, we get everybody standing out of the side of the street waving. That would be wind. <laughs> that would be more like wind technology. Uh, okay. No, wa wave technology <laughs> using buoys and various other technologies out in the ocean, uh, uh, <clears throat> making use of the ebb and flow of the sea. Now, has that actually been implemented? Have any, has. has anybody designed a working yes. system that today is in use generating energy some part, part, in some place in the world? Yes, the United States Navy on the North Shore, near North Shore of uh, uh, Oahu. Yes. Okay, and they, are they using the, something that looks like a little tube thing and the water runs in the tube and the, the tube moves up and down? And I, I, I wish I can tell you the details, uh, but it's, it's classified. It's, it's the United States Navy. I don't have all the details, and I didn't work on that project. You didn't work on that project? Okay, but they're generating energy from the wave. Uh, they the have waves. taken the lead in trying to develop wave energy, wave-to-energy technology, and they have 
implemented it and they've been using it and they're, they're working on tweaking that and having that be a viable uh, future source. Okay, okay. Now, so that's wave energy. Yes. Uh, we also have <coughs> thermal energy from our volcano. We have geothermal energy from but, our volcano. But obviously we have to be culturally sensitive. Absolutely. But I don't know how you do that. I mean, do you do that with a prayer? Do you do that by how you, you know, it's, it's like feng shui, you know? I, I, I'm just trying to figure out how do you be culturally sensitive to geothermal energy? I mean, it's volcano. It yeah. generates heat. Well, as we, we, we know, we know, we understand the volcanoes here. Yeah. We understand Madame Pele. We understand, and I, I always appreciate, you know, remember uh, uh, the, the, the hurricane from a couple of years ago? Yes. That came right up to the big island, hit Pele, and Pele knocked it down, essentially. Mm -hmm. Love that. Have full respect for Pele. For that. Yeah. Um, however, we have, we have the culture in Hawaii. We have the Native Hawaiian culture in Hawaii. Right. And we must always, and this is what we do as Kamaka Green. Um, my wife is president and CEO of Kamaka Green. She's Native Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. She sets the tone for what we do and how we do it. And I'm 100% behind her as far as our cultural sensitivity in all products that we do. Okay. I don't jump into a project if it's going to be culturally insensitive. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess uh, to me, I'm trying to understand mm -hmm. the difference between something that's culturally sensitive or culturally insensitive. I mean, you avoid uh, places that may have um, historical significance, mm -hmm. or I mean, but it would seem to me if you've done that, if you've addressed issues as far as ancestral bones, um, historical sites, uh, then is it a matter of appeasing people who have power within the Hawaiian community and appeasing them? Uh, appeasing isn't. I don't, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't use the word appeasing. I I'm would not sure say what's the right consulting. You with consult them. with I them. would say, you know what, we have an opportunity here to make use of an energy source with regards to this volcano. So let us talk to the kupuna, let us talk to the leaders, mm -hmm. let us get consulting from them and discuss how we might be able to utilize that resource. Because we've done this before. Uh, we absolutely have. We have geothermal energy coming from the big island. Yes, Puna. Puna. Yeah. But it's not really being fully optimized or what's so exploited to the extent that it could be. Uh, right, and there are lots of concerns considering environmental concerns and um, uh, not in environmental concerns as far as the ground is concerned, as well as uh, environmental concerns for the people that live around it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many people who believe that they are sick and they are ill as a result of what is being done there. That's subject to studies and I can't mm -hmm. speak to that other than you know when I go there I get headaches yeah but I get headaches be I think because of the sulfur in the air because of yeah uh, well it's, there is sulfur in the air it just naturally the, occurs the bog, sulfur in the bog the bog gives me a headache and right. I know that that does that mm -hmm. um, I cannot and I will not minimize other people's conditions and, and opinions on the situation but they need to be considered and from an environmental perspective it needs to be studied it needs to be understood mm -hmm. so that we are aware of what we're doing Otherwise, we are guilty of fracking and not caring. Well, that's what, I mean, that's, I mean, to me, that's an, sort of an equal conversation yeah. is what we're doing with fracking. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, there are people who do fracking in a very conscientious uh, and way. I mean, to the extent that they can, they can do things to minimize impact to the community. I, I, would, I would say you can create a perception that you are minimizing impact to the community. However, what we do not know in a fracking situation is exactly how much damage you are doing at, at any given time. How, mm -hmm. how many wells, how many, how many aquifers need to be poisoned? How many communities need to have fire coming out of their uh, uh, um, faucets mm -hmm. before we recognize how dirty fracking is? So when we talk about liquid natural gas and it's a clean choice, Okay, it's clean when it burns, cleaner right, right. when it burns. Right. But the process of extracting it is dirty, and that needs to be in the calculation. The calculus that you use to determine dirty versus clean, in that case, must include the process of fracking and everything involved in that. Right, right. Yeah. And well, it is, yeah, and it's it isn't a total sum, right? You have to look at the total you sum. You must look at the total sum. And, and fine, we're talking about as far as Hawaii is concerned, we're just going to be burning it, so it's going to clean, it's going to burn cleaner. Okay, but yes. But mm -hmm. from Hawaii, the sense of aloha is very important. And we recognize that that means we're good to our neighbors, not just ourselves. Right. 
Right. So when we recognize what they're doing in various parts of the country mm -hmm. and globally with fracking and, and the damage that's being done to those communities, how can we not take a moral responsibility for that as well? Well, so the question is then, when you're doing geothermal, if you're tapping into the geothermal energy mm -hmm. from the volcano, the volcano itself is spewing out a lot of toxins into it, yes, it by is. itself. By itself. I mean, we're not, I mean, that could be impacting the community as well. I, I'm sure it is. Yeah. Except so, I get a headache when I go there. Yeah. So the yeah. question is, you know, are we, are we able to mitigate that? Well, I mean, the question is do no harm. I mean, how do we do no harm? But you have a lot of harm being done just by the very fact that it's a volcano. The volcano itself. Well, the, the yes. question, is, the question is, is, <coughs> it goes back to, I guess, the original question. It's, not just, it's, it's do no harm to the environment, do no harm to the people mm -hmm. as well. So the first question is, when we are approaching land that is Native Hawaiian land, and, and when we want to do something on this land, we can't just show up and go, okay, well, you know what, this is ours now and we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. We must consult with them. We must discuss with them. And that's what happens. When we mitigate, which in many ways is a bad word, in many ways is a good word, depends on what's well, the word Well, there's compromise. I guess there's compromise there's within compromise mitigation. There's in yeah. order to figure out how to achieve the goal. Right. And you, in order to fully respect the people that live in that community, mm -hmm that hold these lands to be sacred in one way or another to one degree or another, mm -hmm. that's why we must get their consult. Right, right. And also, of course, people who live there who maybe are not Native Hawaiians but live in the, commun live in the community. Exactly. You know, exactly. Uh, just as being And good, that's just environmental concerns. That's right, exactly. that's right. Cultural concerns versus environmental concerns. Right, right. They're both very important. In this now, context. we have done a lot. I've noticed there's a lot of wind, wind, um, windmills on some of the neighbor islands. Uh, yes, uh, specifically Maui mm -hmm. and uh, some over on Lanai as well. Uh, but yeah, in Maui. Uh, actually, then there's also the Kahuku one over here, yes. which is startling, I do have to say. I, I like the idea of windmills. I love the idea of windmills. But when you're not expecting it and you drive up on it and you have this monster windmill in front of you, it's like, wow, it is actually a little startling. Mm -hmm. I definitely understand where they're coming from from that. So uh, I, I would I utilize that same concept of, you know what, are we actually considering the people of the community. Well, I guess, you know, one of the things I grew up with as a child that if you want the good, sometimes you have to take the bad that comes with the good. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't get a free lunch. There's no free lunch. Right. Um, there's always a cost. So then you're weighing, out, you're weighing the cost. It's a cost-benefit reward right. calculation. Right. Um, and we've talked about fossil fuels and solar and wind and wave technology. Um, now the question is, is that right now we're still using fossil fuels. Okay. Um, and the question is, how do we go forward? And there's always going to be a cost, no matter what technologies we use. What the, the question is, what costs are we willing to accept? Right. And I think that you, you're, you're, you're sort of segueing in towards the, the idea of global warming and, and climate change. And how well, that yes. Impacts, yes. Uh, because that's what we have to think about. If we're making our decisions with regards to fossil fuels versus renewable fuels, mm -hmm. um, and by fossil fuels I mean petroleum and liquid natural gas, if we're looking at those compared to renewables, that's talking about future. That's talking about, well, when you burn those, what goes up into mm -hmm. the air mm -hmm. helps to create a variety of cascading challenges that make climate change what it is. Mm -hmm. This includes the acidification of the oceans and the killing off of the ocean reefs yes. and, and of many of the animals that live within there. Yeah. And as a result of that, that just creates this negative cycle that is, that's problematic, that will mm -hmm. eventually kill off mm -hmm. more and more as we go. So, I mean, because we could talk about the solar energy, we can talk about wind energy and all these things. Mm -hmm. um, they may create some issues in terms of, okay, we have to deal with windmills. But if we have windmills everywhere and we just learn to contend with wind, windmills or we yes. build better windmills yes. over time, that helps to offset our long-term exposure to the problems with fossil fuels, Correct. then you know, maybe there's a short-term pain with a long-term gain. Sure. And as long as you have, what, what you should not do mm -hmm. is tell people in the community, well, we have to pay for it in one way or another. So, sorry, this is the best place to put this. You're going to be the ones who pay for this. Mm -hmm. You may not want it, but we have to put it here anyway. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. You have to be much more considerate, and you must engage them more in uh -huh. that process and try to find a way, if there is a way, uh -huh. to get their buy-in for what it is. And that's where you find the compromise in order to achieve that goal. You can't just say, well, it's the best thing we've got to do, so I know better than you. We're going to do this. Right. 
So, Better for our future 30 years. Well, you know what? Don't we call that eminent domain? <laughs> yes. Uh, but that's, well, it is an eminent domain. If, if I own 15 acres of land uh, uh -huh. in, in La Ie, and I decide I'm going to lease that land to this company over here that's going to build all these windmills, you know what? It's my land. Yeah. But you know what? I also impact my neighbors by doing that. That's right. So that's not eminent domain, but that is making sure that this is being put into a larger context in the conversation of what's happening and how uh -huh. it's happening. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Uh, thank you. Carl, it's uh, short notice, and, but thank you for coming on. It was a great conversation. Appreciate it. I think there's another energy group coming in behind us, so yes. it'll be very interesting to see what they have to say today about energy as well. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> I'm Chris Leitham. This is The Economy and You. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha.